Welcome to Jazz Zone Together, our new online community where we will provide jazz and music education resources, interviews with jazz educators, artists, and celebrities, along with valuable tips and repertoire suggestions. Today, we're very pleased to welcome a highly successful and prolific jazz composer, arranger, John LaBarber. Bands that have played John's charts through the years are a virtual who's who of big bands, including Buddy Rich, Woody Herman, Count Basie, Dizzy Gillespie, and certainly a host of others. Now I'll bring in Dick Dunscombe to conduct the interview with John. Dick, please jump in. Ladies and gentlemen, today, the John LaBarbera. Welcome, John, to Jazz Zone together. Good. Well, it's good to be here. Thank you, Dick. We're so excited to let you share this information with our viewers, and you've long been a hero of mine. I, I'm so excited to have you here today. We, we usually begin with asking the guests to kind of paint a picture of wh what you were like growing up and how, how your focus and career led you down this music path. Well, you probably know this already. I have two brothers, Pat, who's a saxophone player, my brother Joe, who's a drummer. All three of us are professional musicians. Uh, Pat was with Buddy Rich for seven years, then uh, Elvin Jones on and off for 17 years. And Joe was um, with Bill Evans and Woody Herman and Tony Bennett, among others. And um, So we all are professional musicians. And my father is the one who taught us uh, music. He... Um, he came here to the United States when he was seven years old from Sicily. And um, I won't go into the details, but his father died very early and he was sent off to an orphanage in Buffalo, uh, Father Baker's home for boys. And when he was in quarantine, there was no music in our family at all. Uh, um, not that we know of anyway, but when he was at the orphanage, uh, they put you in quarantine for a couple of weeks to de-louse you and all that. Um, and while he was sitting in the, in the, and this quarantine ward, he heard this band, this marching band, and he had never heard anything like that in his life. And he looked out the window and there was Father Baker's boys band. Mm -hmm. And he was just mesmerized. And as soon as he got out of quarantine, uh, he went to see if he could get in that band because he thought that was fantastic. And now he'd never heard it played an instrument. He'd never heard a brass instrument in Sicily. Yeah, in Sicily, you know, you, or in Italy for, for that matter, but in those days, uh, a peasant couldn't own a brass instrument. Only the wealthy could own a brass instrument. So when they gave him a euphonium to play in the boys band, he thought he was like the richest guy in the world. So he played the euphonium in the boys band. And then um, when he was 14, they took him out of the orphanage and he put him on the railroad as a water boy. Anyway, he, he worked on the railroad uh, from a water boy and working his way up to, to firing, you know, the, the shoveling the coal into the locomotive. But all those years, he taught himself uh, all the instruments. He'd be in the caboose at night. He taught himself clarinet, all the brass instruments, piano. He learned piano. He, he learned all of the instruments on his own. So, uh, and, and consequently, he always had bands uh, in our town and all around. He had marching bands. He had a, a funeral band, which we marched in. Uh, he had concert bands. He had a, a dance band. So he had a number of bands out there and he was playing all the time, but again, part-time, you know, as an amateur. So when we were kids, my brother Pat and I both remember, Joe was too little, but uh, we got home from school and my father had all these instruments laid out on the couch in the love seat there in the living room. And Pat picked the alto saxophone and I picked the trumpet and Joe didn't have a chance because we needed a drummer. So Joe played drums, but he taught us all clarinet first and, because it helps with your teeth to, to, before they're for, fully formed to play clarinet. It's not as harsh on them, I'm sure. Anyway, so we started a family band. My father played everything, valve trombone at clam bakes, or he played piano. When, but anyway, we had, we had a family band. I, I think Joe was five or six. I think he was six when we first started. I was eight and Pat was nine. And we had our family band and we were making our own money. Uh, I think pop paid us $3 each. Now in 1954, 1955, three bucks was a lot of bread. Um, we bought our own comic books anyway. So 
I mean, it was a foregone conclusion that we were going to play music, obviously, and, and maybe not as a career. So we were playing weddings, uh, parties, uh, whatever events. Uh, and my mother got pissed off because she was being left at home. Here's my father taking the three boys out and she's left at home. So she bought a K plywood base. She made a fingering chart. I think my father made the fingering chart for her. And so when she washed the dishes, she'd have that fingering chart over the kitchen sink and she'd memorize the positions. Mm -hmm. And in the early pictures of our band, you could see the masking tape or the adhesive tape things where the stops of the, the fingers are anyway. So she joined the band and we had a family band for all through, all through our middle school uh, days and just a, a year or so into our high school. And that's when we started getting interested in jazz. And so we started playing more and more jazz and started our own little jazz group at school. Um, so uh, we we still played as a family band, but not as much as we did earlier on. And of course, after that, we were so into jazz, then we went on to college for for you know further study. But uh, it was a foregone conclusion that we were going to be musicians. Now, my parents did not discourage us, but back then, if you think about it, and you probably know this as well, both of you, music was not a career unless you were going to be a high school teacher, or you were lucky enough to get into a symphony. I mean, music was not a career of choice. You would go to get a real job somewhere. And those ideas were kind of waved in front of us, but we never bit. You know, we we went right down that path. We were very, very fortunate. We had supportive parents, obviously. So that's how I uh, that's how we all got started. That's really an interesting story. Yeah, you, you were destined. <laughs> I guess so. I yeah. guess so. That that one euphonium went into a lot. We, we had, we had, with the exception of a harp, we had every instrument of the orchestra in the basement. Oh, uh, no yeah. viola, we had a violin, but no viola and no cello, but, but we had all these instruments. It was just amazing. That is amazing. So where did you go to school for college? Well, I started at uh, Potsdam State Teachers College, Crane School of Music, uh, for three years. And, uh, I had a, a, a jazz band. Well, it was called a dance band. You couldn't call it jazz band then. And we couldn't even rehearse on campus. We had to rehearse at, in the library, public library downtown. Um, and then Pat had started at Potsdam for um, a semester, but he, uh, he was the very first saxophone major in the state school system in Potsdam. But Really, uh, they wanted him to play clarinet because that was the normal thing. Saxophone wasn't a legitimate instrument. But long story short, Pat really didn't care for that. It was not a good fit. And he, he came back home and he worked for a year. And then he went to Berkeley College of Music in Boston. Hmm. So and he really loved it there. I mean, he really thrived there. And, you know, I would come home at Thanksgiving and Christmas and I was the third year into my college at, at Potsdam, and he'd be talking about stuff I couldn't even understand. And I had all the credits for theory for a state teacher, for being a teacher. And finally, I says, that's it. So I went to Berkeley after that. Uh, right, not after that, right away. So I went to Berkeley and Pat was there. And then when my brother Joe graduated from high school, he just went to Berkeley. So all three of us were there. And... Um, from there, that's where really I got my my immersion into arranging. I always was the one that could copy the stuff off the record when we were kids because I could hear all those lines. But it was at Berkeley when I finally, when, when it, it was formalized. It was really put down in in a in a in a method which I had never seen before. I was looking at downbeat magazines for little kernels of information and. What, you know, scores weren't readily available back in the 50s and six, early 60s. But uh, so we all were at Berkeley, and that's where um, Pat uh, got the call to go with Buddy Rich's band. And after that, he got me on the band. And then, of course, Joe left, um, and he got a job with uh, uh, Frankie Randall, a singer, a pro one of uh, Frank Sinatra's little protégés. And we all ended up in Las Vegas together because Buddy Rich had a month there. I was with the band. Pat was with the band. And Frankie Randall was the opening act. So we all got, got to be together for a long time there in Vegas. Yeah, it was interesting. That is interesting. So uh, who 
who were your influencers as you came into this profession from from a composition and arranging standpoint? Mentors. Well, all right. Well, that's a very very good very good question. I hate that term, but it is a good question because we never listened to big bands when we were kids. You know, we listened to Glenn Miller. That would be in the house, and uh, you might hear a Stan Kenton occasionally on the radio. But we were all playing small bands, and I really didn't listen to big bands until my freshman year in college. I heard uh, the Woody 63 album with Bill Chase. And I said, wow, what is this? And of course, when I was in college, I was introduced to a gentleman named Her Harold Miller, who's we've been friends now for 60 years. Um, or yeah, well, almost, yeah, 60 years. And um, he, he just introduced me to all these great bands. He was a jazz collector. He was an English major but uh, he ended up being with Carlos Santana. He, he introduced me to all these new pieces of music I'd never heard before. And I was just, that was it. I was grabbed. I play trumpet, but it's, it's a doorstop because the, the arranging really took over and the composing really took over. It just grabbed me. And that's, I think that's why Berkeley helped me a lot because that was really a composition and arranging school at first. Mm -hmm. The Schillinger system, uh, yeah. what, you know, Schillinger method, you know. Yeah, it was like the only place that was really emphasizing that as, as much as, as any place in the country. So yeah. it's written, as you've said, for some of the finest big bands. Tell us some stories about how those relationships developed and maybe how some of the specific charts came about. Oh, sure. Um, well, I had played on Buddy's band. He fired me a couple of times. Um, and <laughs> he but I fired everybody. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> But he respected me. We got along very well. He respected my brother, Joe. My brother, Joe, was the one who would play all the rehearsals and play the charts. And then Buddy would listen and then he'd play them because Buddy couldn't read. Um, so he, he respected Joe, respected Pat, of course. He never gave Pat a hard time ever. In the seven years Pat played with him, Buddy never said boo to him. Maybe he was afraid of him. I don't know. <laughs> but but um, uh, after Buddy's band, I went with Buddy DeFranco and the Glenn Miller Orchestra playing trumpet on that. But that's where I really got my training in that I made a lot of mistakes, but I did a lot of writing for that band. Um, Buddy DeFranco was, you know, he, he saw, he, I think he saw it in me that I wanted to do the writing. And uh, he gave me the challenge of um, transcribing all the Glenn Miller stuff from the 78 RPM records, because all that music, people don't know this, all that music is lost or went away somewhere. But um, we had the library in New York City of all the existing arrangements and transcriptions, air checks and all that. And most of the music the Glenn Miller band was playing w were the transcriptions from the Glenn Miller story with Jimmy Stewart. Mm -hmm. So but Buddy asked me to start transcribing some of the better Bill Finnegan arrangements and some of the stuff that used to be in the book, but was never it was lost. So I would make an extra 50 bucks a week by you know putting my earphones on from the little cassette player and and transcribing the charts i learned a lot from that and then i started writing arrangements of current tunes for the band and he liked that the public didn't like it because you know they wanted to hear all the same old standards but i put it in the glenn miller style and it seemed to work uh quite a bit and i would i would uh, write things like a, a 18 or 16 bar sax solely and after the after the gig at night I'd ask all the saxophones to come into the dressing room. I'd buy them a beer and they'd read down these little slips of paper that I'd write out. So I, a lot of trial and error, but uh, with the uh, Berkeley training and with the, uh, you know, trial and error, I really started learning a lot. I think the most valuable thing if students are interested in this is to transcribe scores. Don't buy the scores and look at them. Transcribe them yourself with your ear. You'll just like a jazz improv, improvised solo, a Lee Morgan solo, copy it by ear. Don't look at the book and then you'll always have it. And I think that's how I learned. And let's see, to, to continue on with that and stop me whenever I'm getting too long winded. Um, after about three years on the or two and a half years on the Glenn Miller band, um, and it's a little poignant, but I realized that I, this was going nowhere. Um, there was an alto player across the aisle from me. Um, is Al Thompson. He was a professional second alto player, didn't have a home, didn't have an apartment. Whenever we had time off, he lived in a hotel. He did part-time work delivering messages. 
uh, and he was a stone alcoholic, but he always played the gig. And I looked across the aisle and I said, that could be me because that's all he did for 30 years, 35 years. So I gave my notice and um, I was on unemployment in New York, upstate New York. And my brother, Pat, was still on Buddy's band. And he told me that uh, Buddy had just signed with RCA Victor Records. So um, there was going to be a cattle call in Philadelphia. The band had a week at Brandy's Wharf. And uh, I was getting 50 bucks a week unemployment and a bus ticket to Philadelphia was 25. So I had my charts, took the bus to Philadelphia during the rehearsal. You know, he would sit there and just listen to all the charts. Bob James was there. Uh, uh, Don Sebesky was there. All the usual. I, I don't know if Micah Benny was there or not. All the usual suspects. And um, my turn came. I put a, a suite that I had written for him. Um, the band played it down. It was three three major movements. And when it got to the jazz waltz movement, halfway through it, he stopped the band. And I said, oh, shit, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> He got up in the bandstand and just started playing that jazz waltz part. And then at the end, he says, be in New York next week. I'm going to record your stuff. Just like that. It was like right out of a Hollywood movie. I thought maybe, yeah, I'll believe it when I see it. But I went to New York and he recorded that that first album for R.C. Victor. I think I had uh, a couple of things from Jesus Christ Superstar. I had uh, Straight No Chaser. I had this sweet I might have done something else. I can't remember, but um, that was my big break. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, to start out that big, RCA Victor was just an amazing, uh, amazing experience. And people don't realize a first pressing on RCA Victor for Buddy Rich was 50,000 LPs was the first pressing. That's a lot of records. Yeah. And I don't think anyone else has had that kind of success in the 60s with a big band like he did commercially. Um, but it was a big break for me. I guess that was the end of your $50 uh, payment from the government. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes, because, um, you know, the record company pays for everything. They pay for the rehearsals. They pay for the, the copying. They pay the arranger. They actually pay the arranger. What a concept. <laughs> it was all, all union scale. And I had... Uh, I had a very good copyist, uh, Larry Abel, and he he tutored me about the way things should be written and the way things should be done through the union. So, yeah, that 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 really started some income coming in and it gave me more confidence. I have to admit, you know, once you finally get something like that, it gives you the confidence to say, yeah, sure, I can write for these other bands. And, and that's how it started. And it's a snowball effect. They say, well, if he wrote for Buddy, if if Buddy would use him, then I'm going to get him, that kind of thing. So that helped a lot. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. It was interesting, interesting kind of timeline, really. Well, it is. And, and uh, you know, another one of the interesting aspects that we need to talk about is Diva. And, oh, yeah. And- no, you were the co-founder of, of that women's big band. Uh, share with us the creation and how it's become one of the international successes. Well, that was, yeah, well, again, it, t- it goes back to Buddy Rich because when I was on Buddy's band, one of the most honest managers Buddy a- ever had, he didn't have very many, but this one was Stanley K. His Stanley K was a drummer. Stanley K played drums in Buddy Rich's 1940s band. When Buddy would sing, Stanley K was the drummer, and he was a very good drummer. And so um, we became friends when we were on. When I was on Buddy Rich's band, he would give you your pay every week, and you'd get paid. And uh, subsequently, when I was writing for Buddy, um, a lot of times the money wasn't there. You know, Buddy was a big spender, so um, Stanley could always find me the money. He'd always find the money to pay me. So there was a, there was a, in 1993, or maybe it was late 1992, um, I had a, 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 an idea for something, a, a, for a big band, and I called Stanley in New York. I said, Stanley, I got this idea for a big band uh, for something I want to do. And it wasn't a, 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 like a John LaBarbera big band. It was just something I had, had in mind. And we got to talking. And he said, well, I don't think that's going to happen. And he, he, he set me right straight about uh, the television company and all these things that were connected with this project. And he said, no, nah, don't bother. I know this guy and this, this is not going to happen. So we started talking 
And he said, you know, I, I went to see the New York Pops Orchestra uh, with uh, Skitch Henderson. Was it Skitch Henderson? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he said there was this girl, and I'm going to use 1993 language and Stanley's language. He said there, there was this girl playing drums, and she played trap drums. He said, I couldn't believe it. He said, you know, you teach students. He says, you teach college kids. He said, are there a lot of girls that can play? And I said, well, not a lot, but there are definitely a number of, of girls, quote unquote, that can that can play jazz. He says, boy, you know, that would make a great big band. It was his idea. He, he really thought when he saw Sherry Miracle, he thought that would be a great band. So we talked and we talked back and forth and back and forth. And so I flew to New York and um, I was teaching at the University of Louisville now at that by that time. And I flew to New York and we had a meeting and we talked about what we can do and we decided we're going to do it. So we had open auditions uh, in New York City and it was very difficult to field a big band of women in 1993, 92, 93. They were there, but boy, it was rough. But we got very lucky with some key players like Lisa Whitaker, a great lead trumpet player who went on to play with the Army Blues Band uh, lead trumpet. Um, we had uh, Claire Daly, a great baritone saxophone player. Uh, Ingrid Jensen, ultimately Ingrid came on the band, but not that, not that first core band. Uh, trombones were very difficult to field, but we put a band together with Sherry Miracle, and uh, we rehearsed most of the early, everything in the early days was mostly my arrangements that were stocks or things I had published or things that I thought would suit the band. Uh, eventually, of course, all the women in the band started arranging themselves and, and it got to be a self-sustaining unit. Um, but when the word got out, I mean, you would think that a band of all women jazz players would be a no brainer. And I have to say right now, it was all we could do to keep that band alive. No, I mean, you would think everyone would jump on it. No, nope, no one jumped on it. We had a we had a vodka a sponsor. Stanley really worked his butt off finding sponsors and finding patrons and things like that. But it was a rough uh, road to hoe, I tell you. Uh, but Stanley was the backbone. Um, I can say this now. It even got to the point where Stanley sold his baseball collection to get the money to keep the band afloat. Uh, he was a big baseball collector. So um, ultimately, the band got through all the initial hurdles and the more and more women were coming to New York city and more and more women were coming out of the schools. And I think it was a key kind of uh, point in time where we were able to have a really professional sounding band and it, it thrived from there. But again, Stanley K was really the backbone of that whole thing. Um, let's see. I think Micah Benny did a few charts. Uh, Rich DeRosa, I think did a couple of charts. Uh, and then Sherry started arranging. Uh, I think by the third album, third CD, I think she started arranging. So um, uh, that's how that started. And um, my brother Pat told me about Ingrid Jensen because she he uh, taught with taught her I think at Brant's or um, somewhere in Canada. I forget what where it was. Anyway, he recommended her. She was working in Austria as a trumpet player, and don't take this the wrong way. It's easier to get an Iranian terrorist a green card than it is to get a Canadian jazz musician into the United States. It was just to get her a green card to come play with the band. It worked out great. Ultimately, it worked out fantastically. But the hurdles we had to go through to get her a green card, it was just amazing. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is between Canada and the United States back then. I don't know what it's like today. But back then, it was it was very difficult for musicians to get green cards in the States. There could have been some union problems. I don't know, but uh, it was something. But anyway, the band really got fully formed. And of course, today it's it's working, you know, whenever there's work. Nobody's working today. Yeah, right. Well, I want to tell our viewers that we, we do have an interview with Sherry. So oh, look good. that up because uh, she talks a lot about the band as well. But being in on the ground floor of that, that must have been really fun. Yeah, I've got, I've got a notebook. 
uh, with all the names of everyone who auditioned. And on the back, I wrote my comments. Mm -hmm. I, I don't dare let that <laughs> let that out. <laughs> I mean, there are some phenomenal players on that band. Um, uh, Virginia Mayhew, great tenor player. She's, of course, she's still thriving today as a tenor player. But uh, you know, I, I could I could probably look at that original personnel list, and I bet every one of them is doing well professionally. Mm -hmm. Great, great. And and you've also had some success on Broadway as an orchestrator. Well, uh, what about yeah, a, little, a little bit? Uh, I mentioned my copyist Larry Abel. Um, I had just finished the Alka-Seltzer uh, commercial, the Plop Plop Fizz Fizz commercial, and I was I was in the office, and and Larry came and he said, "What are you doing?" I said, "Nothing." I said, "I'm just taking it easy. I just got done with this recording, you know." And arrangers and composers all hung out in the same cop copyist office. We all hung out together. So he said, "Listen, you got it." He says, "Come in here to the room, sit down." He said, uh, they just came off the road with chorus line and they're making more changes. So we got to change, I don't know how many pages of score. It was because because Billy Byers had already gone back to California. And I think Rel yeah, Billy Byers went back. So I sat down and they started feeding me pages and all this trans transcriptions and or transposition because they got a new lead. I think it was a new lead male and all the keys had to be changed. And so the cello couldn't go below C. So, you know, you're, you're trying to reorchestrate. So I orchestrated uh, a number of pages on that and didn't think much of it until it became a hit. And then there was a cast album, got paid again. There was a, the movie, got paid again. So it was a, a very financially a great thing, but I hated it. And I did one more Broadway show with, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, Colonel Clink, uh, what was his name? Um, you know, the guy, Colonel Clink in the, in the um, Hogan's Heroes. Mm. Uh, his father was a famous German conductor. Oh, um, boy, why can't I think of his name? He was the principal in the, in the Broadway show. And we were off broad. We, we were out of town, putting the whole thing together. Oh, oh. It's, it escapes me. Darn, I, I wish I could remember. His father's a famous uh, co uh, conductor in Germany. And so he and I would talk about conducting and orchestration. And, and you know, that kind of a job, uh, you sit in your hotel room, all the copyists are in the ballroom, pushing pages like crazy. And those pages uh, from the, 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 um, he used to guy, he would do a condensed score, slip it under your door in the hotel room. You'd have to fully orchestrate it. Then they come and get, take it to the copy. So it was this round robin thing. And um, uh, it, it, uh, it, was, it was probably what turned me off doing orchestration. I like orchestrating, but not as a job like that. I don't know how those guys do it, especially in Hollywood. I don't know how they can put up with that kind of pressure. But, but, you know, it, it, it was a learning experience. I did, like I say, those two Broadway shows. And then that was it. I said, I, I can't do this anymore. But, you know, again, uh, Chorus Line was, it did pretty well. That's I, good. That's I, quite a bit of an experience that, that uh, leads me to my next question. And that's the magic one for the people that are watching, especially the aspiring composers and arrangers. What, do you say to the young students or even educators who want to explore writing in the jazz world? Well, there's a couple of things. First of all, it, my, my students, uh, I'm retired now, of course, from teaching, but uh, what I tell them is if you really are serious about this, you have to go where the food is. Now, I know we can do everything from a distance like we're doing now. When, when it comes to the real day-to-day -day writing, you got to go to New York, Los Angeles, London, and maybe Toronto. You have to go where the work is. And that's, you, you can't do it from a distance because those contractors and those producers, they want to see you there on the spot. They want to see you in the studio. They want to see you for lunch. They want to see you for meetings. They don't want to do what we're doing here, even though it's possible, but they have, that's one thing I tell them, go where the work is. And then you have to start networking because that's how it works. And ultimately, you you will succeed if you're if you have the talent and you have the drive, you can do it. The other thing I say is that um, you have to be tenacious. You just can't 
give up. You know, if you give up, then that's it. You, you just don't know what's around the corner. You just don't know what's going to happen next. So if you stick with it, it's very possible. Now, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. All of us here know about the print media now, especially you guys. And the last couple of years, it's been rough. And I've had a lot of students ask me about that, that work, the print media work. And I have to be very honest with them, telling them that I remember Art Dedrick. He was my very first uh, publisher that put out my work. Great guy. When I was in high school, he did a clinic with us. It was just amazing. Here's this guy in a wheelchair, just knowing everything. And when he signed me on to put out some of my Buddy Rich stuff, he said, John, he says, I don't, I don't publish, um, uh, I don't pub, I don't publish charts. I publish names. He says, when they see Sammy Nesco's name, Dick Dunskim, whoever, they know what that product's going to be. Mark Taylor, they know exactly what they're going to get. And it's going to be good and it's going to be consistent. He says, I sell names. And so that's the name of the game. And the students today, unfortunately, don't have the opportunity to make those names for themselves. It's really disappointing because it used to be a, a natural progression. There were bands to write for. Then you could have the print media as an extra source of income. So that is a really rough uh, kind of a rough uh, thing to tell a kid. Uh, don't count on the print media. You're, you can put it out yourself. You can do everything online. But again, to reach that level of where I am or Mark Taylor or you guys, it takes a, a name recognition. You know, Dick, you did that band method, method right? Yeah, uh, yeah. That's, that's probably got legs like you wouldn't believe. So um, that's the kind of thing that a publisher wants to see. And that's, it's really sad because I think it would be a nice thing for a lot of graduating, you know, college seniors to get out there and get their feet wet, you know, be a writer for hire, you know, just do, you know, write charts by, by the pound, but that doesn't exist much anymore. So I'm sure at the beginning of your career, you didn't uh, use the computer to write with. No. Talk about no, there, the, there was there was no computer, no. Uh, that I forgot to mention that. <laughs> 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 um, but but talk about that and, and the skill set needed. Well, I think it's it's good that there were no computers back then, and I I saw this with all the students, you know. Um, you have to be able to hear it in your head. I can hear it in my head and I can put it down on paper. I'm very fortunate to have those skills. Not everybody has that. We all have varying degrees of expertise. So being able to hear it and being able to work quickly, you know, when Buddy Rich says, I want this chart tomorrow, you're up all night writing the parts out and, and maybe a sketch of the score. Now I can do a little bit of that, you know, Billy Byers, didn't even have to write scores. He would just write out the parts. Um, Don Pystrup was the same way. He'd just have a little sketch in his little book. He'd just start writing out the parts. Slide Hampton does the same thing. Slide doesn't need a score. He just writes out parts, left-handed. And um, I can't quite do that, but I can hear it in my head and put it on the score and then, of course, copy the parts. Now, I wish there were computers back then because that's what I use it for now is you know, getting extracting the parts. I can write a lot faster with a pen and pencil or, and, you know, some King brand score paper than I can on the screen. And I think the detriment for the computer writers is the fact that they sit with it so long, there's no spontaneity. They come back and after a week you've sat with the score, it's a different score that you started with. Mm -hmm. So the, the quicker you can get the ideas on the paper or even in the computer, the, the more cohesive the chart is going to be or the composition. So I guess I'm fortunate uh, in that I started out the, the, the old traditional way. And then when the computers came in, I was able to you know, use them as a tool. I, I mentioned this in another interview, interview I did. <clears throat> I took um, Thad Jones's Quietude and I put it in Finale. And I took um, Gil Evans's My Ship with all those beautiful inner voices. And I, and I have the best uh, computer sounds you can buy. I had them at school. You play those two things back, you would never put that in front of a bunch of musicians. It sounded awful. All those half steps, because there are no overtones. You cannot hear 
the the collective mating of those overtones. And so you would not write that. So if you if you depend on your ear and that computer, you'll never take a chance. You'll never write some of those beautiful uh, voicings that will actually work. Now, if you if you study and transcribe Gil Evans, you'll realize what can be done. But if you use the computer as a as a, a as a guide, then you're in trouble, I think. So I'm curious about one thing that you've mentioned, and and I really in I'm in total favor of what you're saying about transcribing. I think that's not only true for writing, but also for improvising and all of those skill sets. But uh, is in today's world, does the composer arranger have to provide to the band or to the publisher uh, a, a printout of a thing or do they still use copyists? Oh, uh, no, you, you have to, sub to the publishers today, and I'm sure this is universal, uh, you submit your finale file or your Sibelius file. Finale, finale seems to be the standard because it is so powerful. I mean, you can even choose how thin to make your ledger lines, and publishers want that because they have their own look. And you submit the score, and for me, in my case, it's finale, and they have an editor that goes through it, and they put it in a full form of their style because everyone has their own format. And then we get it back for proofreading. We get PDFs back and we proof it and then we send the proofs back. Uh, so everything is done that way today. Uh, well, you know, music prep, music preparation is still a big thing in, in California and in New York City for Broadway. But pretty much in, in the print world, it's that way. It's done with, with digital files. Okay. Yeah, in, in California, in, in, in Hollywood, and I know this world, um, everything is done through music preparation, meaning that you'll take uh, a couple of these, I won't name names, uh, some major film composer, they hum the melody line to the orchestrator, the orchestrator uh, puts it down in in, in not only in finale, but before that, they put it down in a MIDI format, one of the, you know, one of the sequencing, se sequencer programs. So just to, if, for those who I will understand this, if, if they have a, a, a string section in, in the sequencer, they could have 15 tracks of violin one, mm -hmm. which have to be combined into a cohesive line, 20, of cello, whatever. And so the music preparation person has to take all of those MIDI files, put them down into a cohesive form of the string section, and then do dynamics and crossfades, and then put it into print form, into finale. It is so complicated. And most of the houses, the, the, these are all uh, music preparation houses. They hire dozens and dozens of people to do this. Hmm. Well, this has been fabulous, John. Um, what what does the future hold for you now? Well, I mentioned when we talked initially that uh, off camera that uh, I was doing some proofreading. Uh, I was all set to record my fourth CD in New York uh, in April of 2020. Well, you know what happened then. So it, it, it's interesting. Uh, you know, the COVID hit around March, as far as I remember, and even in March my correspondence with the studios in New York was, well, it doesn't look like it's going to be much of a problem. We think we can pull it. And all of a sudden it was just done, you know, so I got canceled. I canceled it actually. So now two years later, hopefully this coming April or May, I'm hoping I can get back into the studio and it'll be a normalcy that, that I'm hoping for a normalcy there. So that's the future. I've got a lot of material since last April that I've written in the meantime, so it gives me more of a selection, but that's the future of my fourth CD because there's nothing like standing in front of that band and hearing your stuff played back to you. Isn't that great? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah it's, no, matter, no matter how much you know what it's going to sound like, you really don't till you stand there and get that sound washing over you. Right. Well, and, this has just been fabulous. And, I, and I, I have to say, you've been one of my favorite composer arrangers throughout my career and 
and an icon to me, John. And I'm Thank so, you. so thrilled that we were able to have this conversation today. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Well, thank you. And, and Bob, I appreciate what you're doing. And I hope the, the, the pendulum swings back to where it's supposed to be in our print media world now. And, uh, and I, I'll, I'll go back and look uh, at Sherry's interview and I'll look at, uh, I, I saw Mark's already, so I'll have to uh, uh, check out the rest of the interviews and uh, let Mark know when this is available so he can, he can bust my chops. About it. Thank you, John. Appreciate your time and, and uh, uh, real education for people uh, to, to view this. To our viewers, Thank you for tuning in. We appreciate uh, your support of Jazz Zone Together. Please watch for future episodes. Mm -hmm.